Welcome to The Selling Show, where we unpack, repack, and break down exactly how top experts sell their ideas, their value, and their services. This is your host, David Newman, and you are in the right place if you want better clients, bigger deals, and higher fees. I know. You're an introvert. You like to keep to yourself. You hate networking. You hate sales. I'm not even sure why you're listening to this show. But if we still have you, are you in luck today? Mr. Matthew Pollard, CSP, that's Certified Speaking Professional, author of The Introvert's Edge and The Introvert's Edge to Networking. Matthew, welcome to the show. Mate, I'm ecstatic to be here. And what a great hook for the beginning of this segment. So obviously, the latest book is The Introvert's Edge to Networking. And I do want to talk about that. But way back in the ancient pre-pandemic days, you came out with this fantastic book called The Introvert's Edge, which is all about how introverts can sell the pants off of everybody else. Talk to us about how did you land on that introvert selling niche and specialization and what were some interesting stops along the way that brought you to that work? Yeah, absolutely. And, you know, to be honest with you, I didn't actually want to write the book. It was just that I couldn't get somebody else to write it. And I'll explain that in a minute. But, you know, for me, I'd built five multi-million dollar business from the ground up. Or, you know, so for me, I'd learned how to market and sell. And I decided when I moved to the United States that I wanted to teach other people how to do it. And I started talking about the importance of differentiation, niche marketing, and sales systemization. You know, there's three things outside the scope of the average consultant's functional skill that they generally don't focus on. And that's why they end up not being able to build a business that revolves around them, their family, and their life. And so I would get up and I would talk about that. And what I realized is that by the time I talked about two of those three principles, people were looking at me like I was somehow a superhero. And you could tell that they projected this natural ability upon me. So I went, you know what, I'm going to have to get real with people. And I started to share my kind of humble upbringings, the fact that I was super introverted in late high school. I had a reading speed of a sixth grader. I had no idea what I wanted to do with my life. And if I wasn't diagnosed with this thing called Erlen syndrome, which basically means I put on a funny pair of colored lenses and miraculously I can learn to read, I really, you know, really wouldn't have gone very far. But my family could see that I was exhausted. And I just, because I didn't know what I wanted to do with my life, that I was, we all agreed I was going to take a year off to find myself. And during that year, well, three weeks in, I lost the job that I'd had, which was data entry at a real estate agency, and fell into this thing called commission-only sales, which, as you can imagine, was terrifying for me. And my first day out of after product training, you know, they give you five days product training, they send you out into the field. It was 93 doors before my first sale. I mean, no one taught me what to say. The first door politely told me to leave, which was lucky because the second one swore at me. But my personal favorite was always getting told to get a real job. I mean, this was the only job I could get. But what happened is after that, I convinced myself that sales had to be a system. And I taught myself how to sell watching YouTube videos. And I got massively better very quickly. I mean, I'd spend eight hours in the field and then I'd spend eight hours home, you know, practicing the next step or focusing on improving the step I was, I was working on, which I wouldn't really wish on anybody, but it happened really quickly. Soon it was, you know, 71 doors, then 43, then 26, then 18, then nine, and then three. And, you know, about six weeks in, my manager pulls me aside and I thought I was in trouble. And he's like, Matt, we just got our national sales figures and it turns out you're the number one salesperson in the company, which just so happened to be the largest sales and marketing company in the Southern Hemisphere. So of course they threw me into management, which I was terrible at, but back to YouTube, learned how to manage. And then, you know, fast forward just shy of a decade, that was this, you know, the success that I had. So I started to share that story to help people realize that we kind of project extroversion on anyone that is successful. Like, you know, you were just recently on my podcast, The Introvert's Edge, where you, I, you know, got to out you as an, as an introvert and I out so many other introverts as well. And that's what I found really inspired people in my presentation. So while of course people gravitated to the primary principles, being told as an introvert, you can excel in sales 
not by trying to become more extroverted, but instead leaning into your introverted qualities. As a matter of fact, that actually leads to you outselling a lot of your extroverted counterparts because you're following a system, a methodical process, instead of winging things, was empowering for a lot of introverts. So I didn't want to write the book, though. So I, I kept saying somebody should write a book on introverted selling. The guy with the reading speed of a sixth grader did not want to be the one writing it. But what happened was I coached a client that was a ghostwriter that we took from making basically no money and believing they couldn't charge $20,000 for ghostwritten books to, you know, within four months, making 120000 the following year, just of 300. Now he charges 130,000 a year. And it's May 2023 when you're interviewing me now. And he's booked out till next year. And he's like, Matt, you have got to put these principles into a book. So we did. And, you know, fast forward to now, I mean, that book's in 16 languages and it sold nearly 100,000 copies. Amazing. 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 One thing that I also did not realize until doing a little bit of more background research is you and I had the same publisher back in the day, which was Amicom. And I'm guessing that Harper Collins did the new book. Absolutely. So actually, funny story, Amicom was bought out by Harper Collins leadership about the week my first book got published. So you've just been through a book launch, so you get this. Everything needs to be perfect for your book launch. You put so much energy and literally you're a hair's breadth away from mental collapse for about three months leading up to it and about two months afterwards. And my publisher gets bought out and nobody picks up the phone. I don't know what's happening. I got given an email that apparently they launched my book two weeks prior because they wanted to get it out before the purchase and I, no one told me. So people were telling me how wonderful my book was. That's the first time I'd heard that my book had launched. So it was definitely a unique situation, but it turned out to be a blessing in disguise because my new publisher saw my hustle, the willingness, and I guess the mission that I was on that we've really created this kind of marching cry for introverts. I mean, we've founded National Introverts Week. There are so many people like yourself that are now outing themselves as proud introverts and helping people realize that they, again, if you want to be a writer or a coder or you know, something that is a more quiet job, you know, all power to you because a lot of people love that and they can make amazing money. But some people want to run their own business, which requires them to sell. Some people want to have a job that perhaps allows them to have a great income that doesn't have that you know, high barrier to entry, like a, a degree that they may not have. And sales is a great opportunity for that in their family. And yet a lot of introverts believe that they couldn't. And I think what's happened is these books have created a movement where it's not, poor you, you're an introvert, let me show you how to survive in an extroverted world. It's be empowered. You actually have skills and abilities and unique competencies that allow you to not just survive in these so-called extroverted arenas, but really thrive and actually excel. Well, it's funny because introverts that really embrace selling, there is obviously financial compensation for that because it's, hey, you make sales, you make money, things are good. Now we get to networking. Now we get to the, the introvert's edge to networking. And I think talking, I and mean, you've talked to many, many introverts throughout all of this and among your clients and audiences as well. I'm guessing the only thing they hate more than selling is networking <laughs> because networking is like one step removed from the sale, even though I know you have a brilliant way of connecting the networking process with the sales process. Networking to me, because I, I also hate networking, big surprise, as a closet introvert now out of the closet, I hate walking into a room full of strangers. It gives me the willies. It gives me like, I'd rather do anything else, including dental work. But you have made this approachable. You have made this systematic. You have made this dare I even use the F word, fun. So talk about where did we move from introverts selling the pants off of everybody to introverts are also amazing networkers and how they commercialize that skill. You know, it's, it's an interesting question because firstly, I found that introverts like us love speaking from stage, though you would think that most introverts would run from that opportunity. Introverts, I have found, love selling. And what happens is 
they start by saying, I don't want to sell. Can I hide behind email and webinar? And in truth, there's a lot you can do to excel at those things. But, you know, my interview with Ryan Dice, the founder of Digital Marketer, said, yeah, you know, you can eventually, but you need to know whether what you're saying is landing. So you've got to have real conversations first. And funnily enough, when people realize that they can sell and they can follow a methodical process that isn't so much about them, but a system And instead of ruminating that night on all the things that went wrong, but using that part of their brain in a constructive way, which is a huge introvert edge, to really plan and prepare, then they love sales as well. I've got one client that said, I'm only selling via webinar. And I said, look, just commit to doing 40 sales calls following a system just to make sure all the words land. Now she won't give it up. She loves it. And the same applies to networking. The thing that we find, though, is when we go into the networking room, what we think makes successful networking, which by the way, doesn't. But the way we see it is when people go around the networking room, do you want to buy from me? What about you? What about you? What about you? We don't want to do that. As a matter of fact, most extroverts don't want to do that. But what happens is that then leads to what I call aimless networking, where you know we'll have these general light conversations and you know somebody will ask you what you do and you respond with this, well, my day job is, because we don't want to be too salesy. But who wants to buy from somebody that says my day job isn't clearly isn't that into it? So we have these shallow conversations and then we exchange business cards with each other with this mindset of, you know, oh, we'll definitely reach out and talk later, which introverts never will, right? We will say to ourselves, you know what, we'll put those cards on our desk. And if they contact us, of course, we'll work with them, but they never do. So eventually those cards end up in the drawer and then in the trash can. And this is the way most people do networking. And what I find is strategic networking is what changes that and makes a lot of introverts see what they do as different in the networking room, which allows them to enjoy it. And firstly, when you think about networking in the way most people do it, it's just wrong. I mean, even the best way of networking, if they had read a lot of books, and it's not just my book that says this, but says be interested before trying to be interesting. Eventually, somebody's going to say, what is it you do? Now, I know for myself, if I say I'm a sales trainer, people look at me like I'm one step above a scam artist. If instead I say I'm in marketing, they go, oh, I need marketing. How much do you cost? And now I'm I'm talking about price. I just met them. So then they say, well, hang on a second. No, you've got to use this thing called an elevator pitch. Okay. How horrible does that sound? I do this for this group of people, even if they have this common objection. So I help people grow their business, even if they're introverted and believe that they can't sell, right? It's just a really bad strategy to go to networking and it all feels contrived. So What I did with the introvert's edge to networking was firstly, I introduced this thing called a unified message because for me, the moment you say, I'm an accountant, I'm a digital marketer, I'm a sales trainer, they put you in this box that you cannot get out of. And the moment you're in that box, you're fighting to get out of it. But truthfully, all you can do is compete compete on price or convince them why, no, I'm different than those ones people you had a bad experience with. I've got magic ruby slippers. It doesn't work. So we have to get out of that box and then stop making it all about us because good networking is about differentiation, separating yourself, and then showing people you care about a difference you're trying to make in the world, not trying to say, hey, I do this for this group of people. I'd love you to buy it because I'm trying to buy a new car. And if you hire me, that's going to help with that, which is what nobody wants to do. Are you loving this interview as much as I am? Holy smokes. Hey, you know what this reminds me of? There's a fantastic sales book that you got to get your hands on right here, right now. It's called Do It Selling. How do I know it's great? Well, I wrote it and you need to read it. Pop over right now to doitselling.com. Now, back to our interview. So let's walk through kind of the stages and steps of the networking process that you lay out in the book. Because the first thing is you and I meet at a networking event or a cocktail party. I read your name tag. You read my name tag. I say, oh, Matthew, what do you do? Like the dreaded question, the question that we all hate. What do you do? What is the formula for answering that question effectively that opens up a networking relationship instead of keeps it surface level and silly. 
Absolutely. Well, first thing I will say is if you get into a networking room, if you already don't have a connection with those people, you've missed out a great deal. In today's digital connected world, if you're walking into a networking room without a plan, but when I go into a networking room, it feels like a bunch of planned conversations that I've set up in advance. So I'm not struggling the way a lot of people are, and anybody can learn this, and introverts are amazing at planning and preparation. But we still have to break that barrier, because if you say you're an accountant or you're an insurance salesperson, good luck. So you have to separate yourself from that. What we have to do is get out of that basket. So I'll give you an example. I worked with a language coach that, I mean, she worked with kids and adults teaching the Mandarin for, gosh, over a decade, charging $50 to $80 an hour. So when she comes to me, she said, Matt, look, I've, I've got this I've got this really big problem. I mean, not only is there people moving into California wanting to start their own Mandarin education businesses and they're willing to charge $30 to $40 an hour, I've got to deal with the fact that there, thanks to this now global economy we live in, there are people in China offering to do it for $12 an hour on Craigslist. And now thanks to our friends in Silicon Valley, there's technology. David, I'll teach you English, you teach me Mandarin. We just won't charge anyone anything. So I'm competing against free. So I'm going to networking rooms and I'm I'm saying to people that I do this and they're like, oh, you know, I got somebody that I'm working with on Craigslist or, oh, have you heard of this technology? Yes, I've heard of it. I hate it. So that's what she was dealing with. And she's like, how do I network? How do I sell in a way that gets me beyond that? And the truth is, I said, this is a long spiral to the bottom. So yes, I can teach you some networking and sales techniques. But the truth is, they're tactics as opposed to strategy. And if you start with strategy, it actually makes the heavy lifting go away when you get to that piece. So what I said is what we need to do is avoid the battle altogether. So I looked at all the clients she'd worked with over the years. And really, while she'd worked with hundreds, there were these two executives that were being relocated to China that she just helped with far more than just Mandarin education. And I noticed, I mean, the first thing she did was she helped people realize the difference between e-commerce in China and the Western world. The second was the importance of respect, like learning the language isn't enough. You have to reduce your accent. Why you have to handle a business card in a specific way and why it matters. And more importantly, how to handle the rapport process in sales. Because, you know, in the Western world, if I'm a bad salesperson, I might say, so David, do you want to move forward? And you'll say, yes, no, or everyone's favorite. Let me think about it. But if in a week from now, you're still saying you want to think about it, I know my chances of getting that sale are going down and down. Yet in China, I mean, they're going to, probably want to talk nothing about business, five or six meetings. They're probably going to want to see you drunk over karaoke once or twice. It's just the difference with them is they're talking 20 to 50 year deals, not transactional relationships like we do. So I'm like, Wendy, this stuff's amazing. I mean, you blow me away with this. Like, what are you doing for these people? And she's like, they're just a few things. I'm just trying to help. Now, everybody here is that's listening to this is in the exact same situation. They're stuck in their functional skill. The reason why you have customers that sing your praises and recommend you to everybody and don't care what you charge is because you do things that you don't recognize either. And I'm like, Wendy, is it fair to assume as a result of the assistance you're giving these people, they're going to be more successful in China? And she's like, I mean, yeah, that's the point, right? I said, great. Let's call you the China success coach. We ended up creating this thing we called the China China Success Intensive. And the China Success Intensive was a five-week program that worked with the executive, the spouse, and any children being relocated to China. Now, she loved the idea of this, but she's like, well, okay, but now who do I sell it to, right? She's wanting to know who to network with, who to sell it to. Now, not only is it going to be easier now that she's got a unique message, she's really got to think about who to talk to, because if you just go after the obvious, sometimes the answer, the, the results aren't as great. So I said, who do you think you sell it to? And she's well, obviously the executive. Yeah, that makes sense. I mean, I moved from Australia to the US. I, I was terrified and they speak the same language here. Imagine going to China. I just don't think it's your ideal client. And she's like, well, obviously the company would pay. Like, yeah, I mean, they got millions of dollars riding on that executive being successful. I still don't think it's your ideal client though. Frustrated, she's like, well, who then? And I said, well, I personally think your ideal client is the immigration attorney. And she looked at me puzzled and I'm like, think about it for a second. These people make Maybe $7,000 for doing a visa, doing all the paperwork, the bureaucracy, they've got to get a customer, it's not cheap. They probably make about $3,000 for doing a visa. I said, so just offer them $3,000 for a simple introduction. So now she's going networking for immigration attorneys. Now she's going to talk to them and saying, you know, how would you like to double your profit for a simple introduction? And they're like, well, we love the idea of that. What do we have to say? She said, all you've got to do is say, congratulations, you've now got your visa. I just want to double check you're as ready as possible to be relocated to China. Now they would be overconfident. They'd say, yeah, I think we're sorted. We got our visa. We got our place sorted. We're learning the language. Kids are good at it too. I think we're set. And they would just respond with, there's a lot more to it than that. I think you need to speak to the China success coach.
She'd then get on the phone with the easiest sale in the world. These people were terrified to go. The organizations were motivated to pay and they were recommended by their attorney. She charged $30,000 for this five-week program. Minus the $3,000 commission, she made $27,000 for the easiest sale in the world instead of struggling to charge $50 to $80 an hour for private consultation. Think about how much easier that makes networking and how you can then talk about that, which we, we can definitely talk about how to structure that conversation. But if you start with the general dialogue, there's not much that separates you and you're likely in the wrong rooms with the wrong message, fighting to get out of a bucket you shouldn't have been in in the first place. Wow. Oh, okay. So everyone needs to rewind, stop what you're doing, pull over the car, get off the treadmill, re-listen to what Matt just shared. Holy smokes. So brilliant. So this goes way beyond networking. This goes way beyond you're an introvert, you're an extrovert. This is sales 501. Like This is graduate level, PhD level, differentiation, distinction, and literally making the competition irrelevant. Absolutely. Now, your audiences and your clients, when they bring you in and you're dropping wisdom bombs like this, is this what they were expecting? Or like, oh, we're doing our entire business the wrong way. Our positioning is wrong. We're commoditizing ourselves. We're easily interchangeable with other people and other companies that do what we do. Matthew, we have an introverted selling problem. It's like, no, you have a marketing, positioning, and strategy problem. Talk to us about how, when you have, I mean, that woman must have been thrilled. I mean, like thrilled to the moon. It's like, hey, 80 bucks an hour or the easiest $30,000 sale you're ever going to make. Are people open to this kind of radical transformation of their overall strategy, positioning, and messaging? And do you sometimes get pushback, even though you're a thousand percent confident that it will work? So the answer is yes, you get pushback, but you get pushback for the wrong reason. See, firstly, when you've got a new business is a great example. What happens is they're like, no, any customer is a great customer right now. So I don't want to turn anyone down. I'm like, hang on a second. As a new business, when you've got less economies of scale, less proof of concept, more competition with more experience, are you seriously saying you want to be as vanilla as them? Good luck. Now, when you've got a really advanced company, what they're saying is, Matt, I don't want to change my website because what if my current customers see it and they go, oh, hang on a second, I'm not in the niche. Here's news for you. They don't care if you start calling yourself a dentist on your website. They know, like, and trust you. They're getting great results. They might say, we saw this on your website. By the way, they're not really looking at your website every day, but if they do see it, they'll go, oh yeah, whatever. Are you still doing what you planned for us? Sure. And they'll still refer you and they don't care what it says on your website either. This is a new market acquisition strategy. So are people open to it? Yes, once you break them past these barriers. And truthfully, once they see that the reason why most business, I mean, if you can't successfully articulate your difference in value when you're in a networking room, when somebody's politely listening to you for two minutes, what chance do you have online? That's why people are taking photos of their dog and their donut for something to say on Instagram, doing podcast interviews every day. Because if you can't be the clearest, you have to be the loudest. So let me break that down because it's really not that hard. People overcomplicate it. What you need to do is you need to say, what are the unique things I do outside the scope of my functional skill? And what is the high level benefit of that? For Wendy, it was rapport, respect, and e-commerce. The high level benefit was China success. For me, I'm a master in neuro-linguistic programming. I'm a business coach. I'm a branding expert. I'm a social media strategist. I'm a sales trainer. I mean, I'm too many things. Truthfully, nobody cares. They don't care how hard it was, how long it took me to learn these things. But when I say I'm the rapid growth guy, the simplicity of that gets me heard in a crowded marketplace. It gets people to lean forward. Now, let's look at, by the way, how little effort that is and how much effort it is to constantly feel like you're convincing and conjoling people in a networking room and convincing and conjoling people in a sale. Because here's what happens when somebody asks me what I do in a networking room. I say, oh, thanks for asking. I'm the rapid growth guy. Full stop. Now, think about what that does in somebody's brain. It does a backflip because I just spent 20 minutes, maybe 10 minutes, you know, giving them value, talking to them about networking connections that might be helpful, being interested in them and helpful to them. And then they ask, they go, oh my gosh, Matthew, I can't believe I've been talking about myself for 20 minutes. I haven't asked you what it is that you do. And I just say, oh, thank you for asking. 
I'm the rapid growth guy. Full step, stop. Like I just said, I'm an accountant and that's the end of the conversation. And what they say is, oh, that's interesting. What exactly is that? Just like when you see a billboard that doesn't make sense, our brains are programmed to open up that door to figure out what it is so we can put it into a box and disqualify it or say we need it. So people say, what exactly is that? And I say, well, one of the things I love to see more than anything in the world is an amazing introverted service provider with enough talent, skill, and belief in themselves to go and start a business of their own. But what I find more often than not, and I just hate seeing this, is they get stuck in this endless hamster wheel of struggling to find interested people, trying to set themselves apart, trying to make the sale, really often feeling like people only care about one thing, price. Do you know anyone like that? Now, of course, they're going to respond with yes, because I already made sure I was coming to the right networking event, and I already made sure I was talking to the right person, which we can talk about how to do that in a minute. But what they then respond is, well, yeah, I mean, I'm exactly like that. Or yeah, I know lots of people like that. Maybe they don't trust me enough yet. And I say, well, I'm on a mission to help people realize that they're not second-class citizens. Their path to success is just different. And if they just focus on three things outside of the scope of their functional skill, which they're usually amazing at, they really can have a rapid growth business that revolves around them, their family, and their life, not the other way around. Actually, you know what? Let me give you an example, because people don't want you to get into a jargon explanation. What they do love is story. And, you know, I speak at a lot of corporate events where I just teach storytelling and I talk about how it short circuits the logical brain and speaks directly to the emotional brain, how it creates artificial rapport that we can build into real rapport. And more importantly, how people assume all the detail is fact so you don't have to fight to get people to believe in you. So I might tell the Wendy story. And then you get to the end of it and they're like, oh my gosh, I'm exactly like Wendy. I need what Wendy has. Or how do you go about doing that? And then understanding that networking is not about selling. If you go into that dialogue and you say, oh, thanks for asking, and you start to explain your packaging, the first thing that's going to happen is somebody's going to interrupt you and all of that flow is broken. And they'll remember also you tried to sell to them. So the relationship is tarnished. So what you want to do is say, thanks for asking, but now's not really a great time. I mean, we're all trying to network and whatnot, but we could set up a time for a coffee or we could have a virtual meeting. We've all got our phones in front of us these days. We can pick a time right now. And that allows you to continue the light dialogues. Networking is not about sales, but networking is also not about that transactional nature and commoditizing yourself and saying, you know, I do this, do you want to buy from me? If you do it differently, what you've done is separated yourself and think about the difference. Instead of saying, I do this for this group of people, do you want it? Because I'd love to sell it to you because I'm trying to buy a car. It's, I love to see this, I hate to see this, and I'm on a mission to do this, which it's not even about me. I didn't even say what I do. I said three things outside the scope of your functional skill. So all they hear is, I care about people and I'm on a mission to change other people's lives. And they resonate with that, which is why they also let me tell my story, which explains my difference and what I do, because they still want me to help them understand and unpack things so they can put me in a box. That is a powerful combination. And when introverts have that, it's like we get people in the ball of our hand and we do what we've planned, what we've prepared, what we've practiced. And we just present the best version of ourselves in a helpful way that's not about us because we hate to talk about us. Yes, 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 yes. So good, so good. You are like a Swiss army knife. I mean, you have so many amazing things going on. Even when folks go to your website, right, there are the Introverts Edge series of books. There's Better Business Coach. There's you as a keynote speaker. Talk about all the different profit centers in your business and kind of what are the different ways that people engage with you? Absolutely. And, and what I would say to people is that's actually a very strategic set of steps. And what I mean by that is that originally when I talk about niching, I'd suggest to people to keep their niche as thin as possible, not to go broad. So people go, oh, Matt's told me to niche. Small business is a niche. Small business is not a niche. Women is not a niche. You need to go very, very small. So when I started I started by just helping introverted business coaches. I was the rapid growth guy for introverted business coaches. That's the Better Business Coach podcast. And I give away templates to help people coach their clients more effectively while teaching them how to grow their business as a non-commoditized business coach. Because the truth is, while you wouldn't want to pay a coach $20, $30 an hour, you can find them and you can get and people put you in the same box as those, which is horrific. So I started with the Better Business Coach and that then led me to coaching and consulting a lot 
of business coaches where then I grew out to coaches and then professional service providers like, you know, accountants, MSPs. And then eventually now I coach pretty much every introverted small business owner and a lot of extroverts that just they're selling themselves for the first time. And, you know, how do you not take rejection personally, right? So they gravitate to the systems and the processes. But the speaking business, funnily enough, I was an introvert that did not want to speak. And you should have seen how much I moved my hands my first presentation. I, I knew what to say, but I didn't know that my hands were going to do, you know, for anyone that's watching on video, it's not fun to watch. And I must have bounced off this stage a thousand times, but I spoke for free originally to get clients. And a lot of introverts, a lot of people, period, they don't understand how to present. So they give everything but the kitchen sink. And everyone says, that was so helpful. Like, we do it in networking as well, right? We say, oh, you should do this and then this and then this. Firstly, it was unrequested. And in trainings, when you're on stage, people say, thank you for all that great value. Let me go and apply it. And then I'll hire you. Of course, they never do because, well, you've given them stuff, but they're not going to hold themselves accountable to doing it. And if they do it, they'll likely do it wrong based on what they remember. So then they'll blame you. Right. So the goal of a speaker is to motivate and inspire action while embedding you as the only logical choice. So what I did is I started delivering my three story presentation where I talked about differentiation, niche marketing and sales systemization, where I threw my introverted story between item two and item three. And originally that was speak for free. And every time I did, I'd tell people not to buy from me and, you know, just download this template, which by the way, people can get that at matthewpollard.com forward slash growth. That template will help you create your unified message and discover your niche of willing to buy clients. And to, you know, it's not, it occasionally works. I mean, I did this in a room of 200 people not long ago for the national freelance conference. And I said, look, do me a favor, put your hand up. If you now believe you have a unified message and have discovered your niche of willing to buy clients and like 97 percent of the room put their hands up. And then I laughed and I said, look, do me a favor, just keep your hands up. If this is the most time you've actively spent working on your marketing, like 85% of the room kept their hands up. I mean, the whole session was 90 minutes long. Then people read books on marketing and they're like, what should I do? I oh, know I need to go back to the, the busy work. That's busy procrastination. It's killing your business. So what I did was I started to offer that template, matthewpollard.com forward slash growth, and I put the link up on, on a slide. And of course, there's always somebody that wants to cut the learning curve, you know, get the results faster. So I'd always make five figures from people in the room from speaking for free. And then people started offering to pay me to do what I would have done for free. And now I get so many of those requests. Obviously, I don't speak for free anymore. I get paid five figures to make five figures. It's a wonderful combination. And all I do is deliver three stories. So that then grew my speaking business. And when my book launched, The Introvert's Edge, what was funny is, you know, predominantly I made my money out of my online program and my consulting business, which taught people how to create those messages, how to niche down. You know, my one-on-one -on -one, though, I only worked with people on short-term engagements to get them those strategies to then implement them so they could go and, you know, they've got that momentum at that point. They didn't need a coach of my caliber. And then I had the online program. But what happened was when The Introvert's Edge launched, there were all these corporations that started reaching out to me and said, we've tried storytelling initiatives in the past and they don't work because it takes so long to operationalize. And we've noticed that everyone else has books on storytelling. You have a chapter on storytelling. Do you think that would be easier to operationalize? And I made a joke. I said, we introverts overcomplicate everything. So sure, I made it super, super simple. But what happened was I delivered a presentation that allowed people to share a story, like learn how to tell a story the right way within like 24 hours. And I showed people from stage how to transform their stories instantly where I would tell their story after asking a few questions in a way that they wished they could tell it. And where people are, oh, was that recorded? I want to, I want to use that. So what happened was I started to speak at all these corporate events as well on storytelling. So when I, you know, that then led to me delivering that at a lot of small business events as well, because the truth is, I believe that while, of course, unified messaging is hugely important and, you know, your version of the rapid growth guide, the China success coach and niching is profoundly important. I believe that most businesses are one story away from the rapid growth business they deserve, because if you're still explaining and a lot of people, especially functional providers, believe that it is their duty to educate the client to make the right decision. Well, sales actually was derived from the term to serve. It's a Scandinavian term to serve. And to me, the best way to serve my customers, and again, if you sell a product that doesn't help your customers, do not use anything I taught you. But if you are selling something that genuinely is going to help your clients, the best way to serve them is to get them out of their own way. And stories 
are the best way to do that because it motivates and inspires action while embedding you as the only logical choice in order to help with that action, which allows you to then make sure they get that action and get the results. So as long as you believe in what you do and as long as you actually know the results, because a lot of business owners don't actually know the ROI that they provide, which is madness, but that's the case. So as long as you know that and you can build it into a story and motivate a customer to take action, that is the best way to serve a client. And that's why I believe creating one story, like in my case, the Wendy story, is all a business needs to do. I share that on a lot of podcasts, a lot of stage presentations, networking events. That one story has made me millions, and I've seen so many organizations make millions and millions of dollars out of one story, except people overcomplicate it. Like, I need 100 stories. Why? Because they've got no niche, and they can't articulate to the clear value that they provide that niche. So keep it simple. What's my niche? What are the three major problems they have? Write a story for each one of those of a person that had that problem, you got them to an outcome, you got them to an amazing result, And then what you'll find is one of those stories will rise above the rest. And that becomes the one story that's going to make you a fortune. Wow. Now, in that unified messaging framework, do we tell that story in the networking context? Do we tell that story once they've established some interest in wanting to buy from you? When's the best time to deploy that story? Absolutely. Well, there are two answers to that because a lot of people say, when's the best time to deploy it? But then, hang on a sec, that was a relatively long story. So when I'm on a podcast interview, I can obviously expand it. When I'm delivering that story from stage, I might expand it even further and give even more detail because people have come to be entertained and engaged and they're here to get great content. When you're in a networking room, you've got less time. But here's the funny thing. So I taught storytelling to a a group of cold callers that sell commercial real estate. And I talked about how it short circuits the logical mind and builds rapport. And there's this one guy and, you know, his, his name was Alex Durham. And I mean, like he happily called himself the bulldog. He'd get hyped up on coffee and every morning fists on the table, yelling at the phone. Every conversation was like a, a photo be vanquished, a, a war to be won. It was horrible. I couldn't imagine being him. But he's like, Matt, they give me eight seconds on the phone before they hang up. And I'm like, dude, the ones you're keeping on the phone past eight seconds, they're the ones that you've bullied. That are, they don't want you there. And they're usually not the C-level executive. So we need to agree that something has to shift. And we gave them this really simple introductory script that they would use that would then lead to, if they were lucky, an appointment, but more often an objection. And what we found is what we teach them to do is say, I perfectly understand. The last thing I want to do is waste any of your time. However, which was like an objection cushion, right? Gave people time to think what story to tell. And then they started telling stories, cold calling, C-level executives, they kept people on the phone for over two and a half minutes on average, right? Think about the difference that it has. So what happens in networking events is people say, Matt told me to tell stories. So I'm going to tell stories, but what I'm going to do is give them the key dot points because I'm trying to do it quickly, which comes across as a news broadcast, right? People Mm -hmm. watch news for minutes before they get over it, but people watch a three-hour movie and still feel engaged. So what you want to make sure is very similar to the story of how you met your, your husband or wife, right? The story starts off a little bit bulky, but then it becomes a theatrical masterpiece. And even though it's likely longer, people love it. So what you have to do is tell your best story with the real emotional drivers of the real people in it. Not, oh, I worked with a customer once and we got a great outcome, but John was going through these issues so I can feel the pain of John and the outcome that you got them to so they can feel that win. And if you do that, you can actually tell a story a lot longer And you can do it in a networking event. So yes, you should use a story in that initial networking meeting. Use that instead of selling to them, tell them that story to explain because you got them hooked with the networking pitch. Then you say, actually, let me give you an example. And oh, thank goodness. I thought I was going to get a sales pitch or a product explanation or jargon. Now I'm getting a story. And when they hear that story in your head, every second is going to feel like 100. But to them, they're engaged. They're really excited about it. What's fun about that, though, is when I go and do a sales conversation with them afterwards, I don't even need to tell them another story. All I've got to do is remind them of the story that they heard. So I'll say, do you remember the story of Wendy? Now, by the way, people don't believe this when I tell them because people remember up to 22 times more information would embed into a story. And people are like, no way. And I'm like, no, really? When I used to sell telecommunications, sometimes people would have like 10 brochures from other door-to-door salespeople next to them. And I knew they'd remember more of what I said than all of them combined. And like, I'm struggling to believe it. And so I do this from stage. I'm like, all right, let's pick somebody at random. And I'll pick somebody and I'll say, do me a favor. Can you remember three items for me? I don't want you to write them down. And I'll I'll say, I don't know, let's pick three random items here. Chairs, you know, what we sit on. Porridge, you know, what we eat for breakfast. And beds, what we go to sleep in. At least hopefully we go to sleep in beds. 
And I, I'll list those three items and for everyone here. I'll ask you the same question. Can you remember those three items? I'm going to come back a year from now and ask you, by the way, and I want the items and I want them in order. And everyone's like, no way, except for those people that have recently told their child the story of Goldilocks and the three bears. Those people remember those three items, no problem. And all the people now listening go, oh, of course. And the reason being is we get instant recall because it becomes tangible when it's embedded into a story. So when I go into a sale, First thing I do, I don't have to build as much rapport because a story that I built in the networking room, you know, there's a study out of Princeton that highlights that it actually activates the reticular activating system of our brain. It creates artificial rapport, which means I now have this strong amount of rapport. And all I've got to do is say, do you remember Wendy that I mentioned in the networking room? And they're like, oh, yes. And it brings back all the detail and reminds them of the rapport we have. And I can do that within minutes of the beginning of the sale. And then all of a sudden, I'm back to where we were without distractions, having a dialogue with someone that remembers exactly why they booked the call. Holy smoke, so much value in this episode. Listen, if you are loving what you're hearing, feel free to download, subscribe, tell a friend, leave a review on Apple Podcasts or wherever you're listening to The Selling Show. Now, back to the interview. That stimulates, I would imagine, a very similar response to the famous scene from when Harry met Sally, I'll have what she's having. Absolutely. Like whatever you did to Wendy's business, I want you to do that, Matt, to my business. And you're hired and boom. It's the, I'm guessing that all of the defenses, all of the excuses, all of the objections at that point melt away because you're painting a picture. You know, here's the happily ever after. Here's where she ended up. Would you like to end up somewhere similar in your business, in your industry, with your prospects and your customers? Yes. Great. Sign me up. Absolutely. And you think about how complicated it would have been to explain differentiation, niche marketing, and how to build it into a networking structure. The story of Wendy does that, but it makes it tangible. When you explain it, they're overwhelmed and they're like, that sounds interesting. And they run for the hills because they just got a fire hose of information. So people want to try something on and go, that works for me. But here's the real amazing thing about storytelling that I just love is when you tell them a story, they do exactly like you're suggesting. I want what Wendy has because I've experienced it now because I've imagined Wendy and I now see the result. And I want that. I, more than that, I don't want to lose it because I feel like I just got it. So the science behind why story works is powerful. But more than that, the thing that story does is it takes you away from saying, well, you always do this in, you know, in networking events. Yeah, but my situation is different. Or, you know, when somebody gives you functional advice or ideas or said you need this, they're like, yeah, I'm not sure if it'll work for me. You can't disagree with the story because when it's Wendy, you can't disagree with her experience. That's her experience. So what happens is we just detach from all of that. That's what I mean by the science behind the logical mind, just short circuits and you speak to the emotional mind because it just lets go of all of that and it just enjoys the story and it interprets the moral. And if the moral of the story is, I worked with someone just like you who wanted what you wanted and we got them to this amazing result, the only thing that goes through their mind is, I'm like Wendy, I want that outcome and I already feel like I got it because I've imagined it in the story and our brain can't process the difference between imagination and reality. So it's like, I feel like I've now got FOMO if I don't say I want that outcome and it gets people to lean in. So networking, instead of just winging it, which introverts are terrible at, by the way, if you didn't realize, because we all know, I was terrible at it. David, you already said you don't enjoy it that much. And I bet every other introvert listening feels the same way. But if we plan and prepare and we think through what our unified message is going to be, what our I love, I hate, I'm on mission to, and what our story is going to be, then all of a sudden we've got all of this science that we're manipulating that allows us to, again, and the reason why I say this and remind you of it is to serve our clients because, again, this stuff is dangerous put in the wrong hands. But most introverts, I find, they got into business because they want to make a great six-figure income doing what they love in a business that revolves around them, their family, and their life. And they saw that what was happening with their current employer, they didn't. They thought they could put a different flavor on it and make it better or help their customers more or they got upset with the way it was happening and they wanted to do something new or they've got this great product or service that they feel can really help people. Now, sure, there are people out there that have products that don't help I find a lot of introverts, well, most introverts, if not all introverts, won't do that because for us, 
we have to feel authentic and congruent. It's one of our natural say, and I'm not saying extroverts are the ones that sell, you know, things that they shouldn't. I'm saying that it's more likely that that's the case. But the truth is that if you sell something that serves, your job to serve is to get them out of their own way and get them in front of a product or service that is going to make their lives easier, better, and make more money. And let's face it, they're used to pitches from everybody. And the truth is that if you don't learn how to do it like this, then somebody else who has gifted the gab will sell them something that's less helpful to them and will cost them likely twice as much money. Amen times 10. Oh my goodness. Well, Matthew, as we are landing the plane here, I've got two final, final questions for you. One is about how can we get our hands on more Matthew Pollard brilliance? Before we get to that, second to last question is if folks were to take one overarching concept from our conversation today about the superpowers of introverts, both in selling and in networking, what would you hope that one takeaway concept would be? that you've been telling yourself a lie your entire life. If you think that you can't sell, network, speak from stage, there are two people here, by the way, that probably the best in the business at doing it and get paid well to do it and teach others how to do it that are telling you you're wrong. But also Zig Ziglar, the most probably well-known sales trainer on the planet, was introverted. Ivan Meisner, the founder of BNI, the world's largest networking group. I was on the phone with him last week. We're great friends. And I can tell you, he is definitely introverted and he knows it. He's been on my podcast, The Introvert's Edge, talking about his midlife discovery of that. And then if you think, by the way, you can't do small talk because that's the thing we're all terrible at, right? Well, hang on a second. Oprah Winfrey and David Letterman are introverts. So what we're doing is we've got a barrier where we believe we can't. That's what we have to break through. Because if you break through that, then you'll actually look for the strategies. Now, it's not like the secret. You can't just believe it's possible. You know, the number of people that read my books, and they're, Matt, your book changed my life, but then they don't apply the principles, right? Knowing that you can and actually doing the work are two different things. So my suggestion to you is break through that belief barrier and put good energy and effort behind those ideas or principles that you learn. But here's what I would say. If you want to learn to speak, if you want to learn to network, if you want to learn how to make friends, find one introverted mentor you can believe in. And I do believe it needs to be an introverted mentor. Now, yes, I have the word introvert on my books, but there are other introverts out there in all disciplines that can teach you. You just discovered David's an introvert. So if you've been listening to his stuff going, you know what, David, that's good for you, but you're an extrovert. It's not going to work for me. Now know that you've been lying to yourself and you actually can use all of his ideology to excel and not just to hide behind your computer stuff, but all of it. That's the thing that I would suggest. Stop giving yourself excuses. Find somebody that self-identifies as an introvert and trust their process. But then focus on just one thing, whether it's networking, whether it's sales, because what happens is we overcomplicate things as introverts and also because we're trying to hide. So what we say is we're going to learn networking, sales, speaking. No, we're not. We're not even going to do one of those if we say that. Then what happens is people say, well, I'm going to be the best at sales. I'll pick up six books on selling. No, sales is not like mixed martial arts and you're overcomplicating it. Find one system you believe in and just do that. Regardless of whether you choose to do it with me, of course, I'd be honored to show you how, but I'd be more honored if you just did something with somebody that you believed in. But if you do want to learn how to create your own unified message and discover your niche of willing to buy clients, Go to matthewpollard.com forward slash growth. Download that template. That would be the one thing I would tell you to do. Now, don't do it by yourself. Send this podcast episode to somebody else and get them to listen to this. Get them to hear the story of Wendy and say, I want that too. And then do it with them. Somebody that isn't from your functional skill. So if you're a business coach, do it with a florist or an attorney. Don't do it with another business coach. And spend an hour and a half on each of you. Three hours later, your business will be forever different. But then you need to know how to network and sell. And my my publisher hates me when I say this. You do not need to buy my books to do that. Just go to the introvert's edge to networking.com and download the first chapter of my networking book. You know, I joke that in my first chapter of my sales book, I literally outline the seven steps of a sale. And I say, if you do nothing more than put what you currently say into that, right, you'll quickly realize there's some things that are out of order. There's some things that don't fit. Throw that out. You shouldn't be saying it to customers. Then you'll realize there's some gaping holes, like asking the right questions, not just questions, and telling stories. If you just do that, you'll double your sales in the next 60 days and then reinvest that time into the next step and the next step. But don't overcomplicate it. Just start there. So good. Holy smokes. My friends, this is a keeper episode. You will want to re-listen to this not just one more time, not just two more times. I'm thinking about three more times. 
and then one or two more times after that. Matthew Pollard, you are a rock star. You are so generous, so amazing. Thank you for dropping all of this wisdom. We're going to wear out the racing stripes on this episode, my friend. I appreciate you. Thanks for being on. It was my pleasure. Thanks for having me. And that wraps up another episode of The Selling Show. Hey, tell you what, if you like us, rate us and review us on Apple Podcasts, subscribe, tell a friend, go grab the notes and downloads and extras at thesellingshow.com. See you next time.